Good morning. Welcome to worship here at Kimne Parish Church. To all who are here in person, all who are watching live online via our streaming service, especially our brothers and sisters at Littlewood Court and all of our members and families and children who are at the church center right now for our live service for this month's Super Sunday. Welcome to worship. And to all who are watching live online, we are delighted to have you join us as well. And welcome to all guests who are worshiping with us today. I've been told that we have the Minister Emeritus from the Episcopal Church in Afford with us today, so welcome most warmly. And we have a visitor from America over here, yes, and a visitor from Inverness as well. Welcome to worship. We're delighted to have all of you with us. More intimations later, but for now, we give thanks for the freedom and blessing of gathering together in this place as God's people. Everything we say, everything we do here is about Jesus Christ. He is the source of our faith, the source of our hope, the source of the joy we have as brothers and sisters in faith. And so we gather to worship Jesus, and we do so by singing our first song of praise, which is, The Lord's My Shepherd. And during the singing of this song, our offering for God's continued work for the building of his kingdom here in Kemne and beyond will be uplifted. Let us pray. Loving Heavenly Father, you are our true shepherd. You are our true guide, our true comfort. And we believe and we trust that your mercy, your goodness, follows us through each and every day of our lives. We gathered here, Lord, in this place of worship, finishing one week and about to embark on another. And you know our hearts and our minds. You know our very selves better than we could ever hope to. You know what has 
worked well for us this week? What has caused us struggle? You know those things in our life which have made us more like Christ. And you know those things, those sins that have kept us from you. So in the next few moments of silence, Lord, we do confess to you in full trust and in faith as you, as our loving Father, those things which have hindered our walk with you. Loving God, you promise true and lasting freedom to those who hold fast to Jesus Christ as the source of life, hope, and faith. As we embark on this week as your people, give us new passion for the good news of the gospel. Give us new zeal to share that good news with others. And may everything that occurs this coming week May it be used for your glory and for your purposes in each of our lives. Help us to offer not just these offerings, but our whole selves to your service. Give us the grace, Lord, to do so. And as a sign of our faith and confidence in all that you can do for us, we now join our voices together in the very prayer that Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Friends, brothers, and sisters, the gospel must always be good news and the good news of the gospel is that there is a true wideness in god's mercy and so we sing together that hymn now in worship to god So I said at the start, this is Super Sunday today, so our children, our families are over at the church center enjoying activities and watching the live stream as they are able in the midst of the fun. So if you join me now in a brief word of prayer for our children, let's pray. Loving God, we give you thanks for every child, every young person who is a part of this church family. On this Super Sunday, we pray your blessing upon each of them as they enter crafts and activities, as they come to know you more and more through the love of other believers and through the love of their families. 
And we also pray this day, Lord, that all young people, all children in this village would come to saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. Help us, Lord, as your church to never tire of reaching out to our young people, the next generation of faith that you wish to raise. Use us, Lord, for your purposes to build up your church here in Chemney. We pray these things in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. Now sing our next song of praise, Those Who Wait on the Lord. first reading from Holy Scripture comes to us from the Old Testament, from the book of 1 Samuel, chapter 24, verses 1 through 22. This can be found starting on page 296 of the Church Bibles. I invite you to take a copy of the Church Bibles or to open your own Bibles if you've brought them and to follow along as we hear the Word of God read aloud. It's first from 1 Samuel. After Saul returned from pursuing the Philistines, he was told, David is in the desert of En Gedi. So Saul took 3,000 men from all Israel and set out to look for David and his men near the crags of the wild goats. He came to the sheep pens along the way. A cave was there, and Saul went in to relieve himself. David and his men were far back in the cave. The men said, This is the day the Lord spoke of when he said to you, I will give your enemy into your hands for you to deal with as you wish. Then David crept up unnoticed and cut off a corner of Saul's robe. Afterwards, David was conscience-stricken for having cut off a corner of his robe. He said to his men, The Lord forbid that I should do such a thing to my master, the Lord's anointed, or lift my hand against him, for he is the anointed of the Lord. And with these words, David rebuked his men and did not allow them to attack Saul. And Saul left the cave and went his way. 
Then David went out of the cave and called out to Saul, My lord, the king! And when Saul looked behind him, David bowed down and prostrated himself with his face to the ground. He said to Saul, Why do you listen when men say, David is bent on harming you? This day you have seen with your own eyes how the Lord gave you into my hands in the cave. Some urged me to kill you, but I spared you. I said I will not lift my hand against my master because he is the Lord's anointed. See, my father, look at this piece of your robe in my hand. I cut off the corner of your robe but did not kill you. Now understand and recognize that I am not guilty of wrongdoing or rebellion. I have not wronged you, but you are hunting me down to take my life. May the Lord judge between you and me. May the Lord avenge the wrongs you have done to me, but my hand will not touch you. As the old saying goes, from evildoers come evil deeds, so my hand will not touch you. Against whom has the king of Israel come out? Whom are you pursuing? A dead dog? A flea? May the Lord be our judge and decide between us. May he, he consider my cause and uphold it. May he vindicate me by delivering me from your hand. When David finished saying this, Saul asked, Is that your voice, David, my son? And he wept aloud. You are more righteous than I, he said. You have treated me well, but I, I have treated you badly. You have just now told me of the good you did to me. The Lord gave me into your hands, but you did not kill me. When a man finds his enemy, does he let him get away unharmed? May the Lord reward you well for the way you have, you have treated me today. I know that you will surely be king and that the kingdom of Israel will be established in your hands. Now swear to me by the Lord that you will not cut off my descendants or wipe out my name from my father's family. So David gave his oath to Saul. Then Saul returned home, but David and his men went up to the stronghold. Our second reading comes to us from the New Testament from Paul's letter to the Romans, from chapter 12, verses 9 through 21. This can be found on page 1139 of the Church Bibles. Paul writes to us, Love must be sincere. Hate what is evil. Cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in brotherly love. Honor one another above yourselves. Never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor, serving the Lord. Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. Share with God's people who are in need. Practice hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Mourn with those who mourn. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be proud, but be willing to associate with people of low position. Do not be conceited. Do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everybody. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Do not take revenge, my friends, but leave room for God. For it is written, it is mine to avenge. I will repay, says the Lord. On the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. For in doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. This is God's word to us this morning. May his blessing be upon this reading, and to him be the praise and the glory forever and ever. Amen. We now sing our next hymn of praise, Breathe on Me, Breath of God.
Let's pray. Lord, we have heard your word read this morning. We pray now that your Holy Spirit would be breathed afresh upon each of us, upon our minds, upon our hearts. May the words of my mouth and may the meditations of our minds and our hearts be pleasing and acceptable in your sight. We pray these things in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. So this week we're continuing this journey we've been on through the biblical narrative of 1 Samuel, this record of Israel's transition from a federation of tribes into a nation, into a monarchy. Now, as we've heard over the course of these weeks through this book, we know the character of Saul, the first king of Israel. We know that he was headstrong and brash, Though he may have been well-intentioned, he did not always follow God's commands, especially those given through the prophet Samuel. Saul was well-intentioned, as we said, but his headstrong nature compromised his ability to always be obedient to the Lord. And so we're told in the text that Saul was ultimately rejected as king, though he wasn't immediately removed from the throne. And unbeknownst to Saul, God sent Samuel to anoint another, one who would eventually succeed him as king. The name of this young man who was to succeed him was, thank you, was David, the youngest son of Jesse. And after David was anointed by Samuel, we are told that the Spirit of the Lord rushed upon David. And God was with him in all that he did. He won success in the eyes of all of Israel. And so the Spirit of the Lord was with David, but it had departed from Saul, which meant that Saul was at the mercy of his own sinful nature, his own fears, his own insecurities, his own jealousies. After a great military victory, when the crowd sang, Saul has slain thousands, but David, David, his tens of thousands. We are told that Saul was consumed by rage, and from that point on, the text tells us that he watched David with a jealous eye. That's a great descriptor, isn't it? A jealous eye. And eventually, after many attempts against David's life by Saul, last week, our David brought attention to the passage in which Saul's son, Jonathan, warned young David to flee for his life. And over a succession of passages, we are told that David did indeed flee for his life. But being a headstrong person, Saul did not want David to escape, so he went off in hot pursuit so he could finally claim David's life and secure his grip on Israel's throne, or so he thought. And this brings us to the action in our passage from today, which I read aloud for us a few moments ago. In this passage, we are told that David was in the wilderness of the En Gedi, which is west of the Dead Sea. We're told that Saul took 3,000 men in pursuit. And here again is what the text says. It says, As he came to the sheepfolds by the way where there was a cave, Saul went in to relieve himself. David and his men were sitting in the innermost parts of the cave. They were further in. And the men of David said to him, Here is the day the Lord has given to you. Behold, I will give your enemy into your hand. You shall do to him as it seems good to you. So David arose from his hiding place and went off and stealthily cut off a corner of Saul's robe. And afterwards, we're told that David's heart struck him. His conscience was smitten because he had cut off a corner of Saul's robe. He said to his men, The Lord forbid that I should do this thing to my master, the Lord's anointed, to put out my hand against him because he is the Lord's anointed. So David persuaded his men with these words and did not permit them to attack Saul. And Saul rose up and left the cave and went on his way, completely unaware. So what do we hear from this text? We hear that Saul unknowingly stumbled upon David's very location. And even though (laughs) Saul was in the most vulnerable position possible, David refused to do harm to his person and he was struck in his conscience even by taking a little snip 
out of his robe. So why? Why did David refuse to kill Saul? Wouldn't that have made everything easier for David to take care of the one person who was hunting his life, making his life a misery? After all, David, we're told, was the newly anointed king of Israel. By right, the throne was his for the taking. We hear the answer, though, in verse 6, when he said to his men, The Lord forbid that I should do this thing to my master, the Lord's anointed, to put out my hand against him, because he's the Lord's anointed. Don't you get it, you guys? <laughs> That's what he's saying to them. And I think this is absolutely incredible that despite everything that Saul had done to him or tried to do to him, David still had reverence and respect for Saul as king. And therefore, he felt compelled to spare his life, even to confess to Saul that he had cut off a snippet of his robe, when he could easily have done otherwise. And in the eyes of his men, in the eyes of Israel, he would have been fully justified in doing so. This makes me think back in my own life when I was serving in the American Air Force as a new lieutenant in the chaplain service. And like all other officers who were going into medical, going into law and to chaplaincy, I had to go through an officer training program, commissioned officer training, COT, military loves their acronyms. It's down in Maxwell Air Force Base, just outside of Montgomery, Alabama. And we had a lot of instructors of various ranks, and we are always expected to follow instructions and follow orders as one done in military context. And I have to conf confess, on one occasion, I did not measure up to expectations. And so I, along with others from my group, were taken into a hallway by a senior officer, and we got a talking to, <laughs> shall we say. And I remember, I don't remember the content, but I remember it's a very loud volume, <laughs> very loud volume. And at one point, the, the captain's face was about this far from my face, right? And I was having to stand at attention like this. I could not look him in the eye. So he was right here. I was right here. I had to stare ahead. And I'm thinking, don't sneeze, don't sneeze, don't sneeze. And he said to me, Lieutenant, what are you thinking right now? <laughs> and I thought on the inside, I wish you'd get a breath mint. <laughs> But on the outside, I said something to the effect of, sir, I was thinking how I like to perform better next time, sir. You know. And he went down the line and did the same thing to every other person. And he was eventually satisfied with that answer, and he let us go on our way. And I remember talking to another senior officer after that event who gave me a wonderful piece of advice. He said, in your career, in your life, you're going to encounter colleagues, superior officers, and people who will not treat you with any sort of respect, who may even actively work to make your life harder. When you encounter such people, do not repay them in kind. Hold yourself to a higher standard. Respond to their behavior with courtesy and with respect, even if they haven't earned it even if they haven't heard it. And if you find this too hard, if you cannot respect the people who mistreat you, then at least respect the rank and the office that they hold. I've had many opportunities to test out this advice, and it's proven in my life to be invaluable, not just in a military context, but in life as a whole. If you cannot respect the people who mistreat you, Respect the rank, the office, the station that they hold. And I think this is precisely what David did for Saul in that cave. He knew what sort of man Saul was. There was no mystery about this. He knew what he had done. He knew that he wanted to pin David against the wall with his spear. But David spared his life anyways because he was still the anointed king of Israel. And we know at this, at this point in the text that Saul had absolutely no idea that David was in that cave in a position to take his life. And after Saul left the cave to go on his way, our text tells us that David followed him out of the cave 
showing him the piece of the garment. And he proclaimed to Saul, I had every opportunity, but I did not put my hand against my master, for you, Saul, are the Lord's anointed. And even though the Lord's anointed meant David great harm, David chose a better way. The better way of grace, the better way of mercy. So I have a question. What is grace? Not a trick question, I promise. What is grace? Say again. Something unearned. Something unearned. Oh, I like that answer. What's mercy? What's mercy? Say again. Yes. But what's mercy? What's the difference between mercy and grace? Are they two sides of the same coin? Maybe, right? But when someone says, have mercy, what are they asking you to do? Despair. Say it again. Despair. Despair them, yes. Right, because they've done something deserving of maybe not being spared. Right, but they're asking for a special favor. Yeah, those are good answers, right? I once heard it said like this. Grace is when God gives us what we don't deserve. And mercy is when God doesn't give us what we do deserve. I'll say it again. Grace is when God gives us what we don't deserve. And mercy is when God doesn't give us what we do deserve. You hear the difference? Yeah. And one of my all-time favorite stories about Grace and mercy comes from the pen of Victor Hugo, who wrote many things, but amongst which he wrote the masterpiece Les Miserables. Anybody ever read Les Mis? Anybody ever seen the production Les Mis, the movie with Hugh Jackman? What a wonderful singer he is. He's good at everything. <laughs> Jealous. But there's a story in Les Mis about the, the chief character, Jean Valjean, earlier on, when he is basically a low life and a thief. And he's invited, he's given shelter for a night at the bishop's residence near his village. And in the middle of the night, he gets up after eating at the, the bishop's table, accepting his hospitality. What does he do in the middle of the night? Anybody know? Yes. Well, he steals the bishop's silver. And then shortly thereafter, he's arrested for this heinous crime, stealing from the church. They brought the, the police, bring him back to the bishop to identify him, saying, is this the man who stole your silver? And the bishop sees Jean Valjean, turns around and he says, my friend, you forgot the candlesticks. Take these two. What a moment. And that moment of grace and mercy changes Jean Valjean's entire life. It brings him back to God. The bishop tells him, today I have bought your soul for God. And the whole rest of Jean Valjean's story is about trying to live a redeemed life from that point on. It's an amazing moment. So if you've never read the book, if you've never seen the play, never watched the movie, do one of those three things, please. It's a beautiful story. And stories like Les Mis, Remind us that grace is when God gives us what we don't deserve, those candlesticks. And mercy is when God doesn't give us what we do deserve, being handed over to the police, in the case of Jean Valjean. And in that cave, David showed Saul the better way of grace and the better way of mercy. We know from the text that God used these actions of David to break through Saul's veil of anger and jealousy, and for the very first time, for the very first time, Saul accepted God's plan for David's life. He said to David, you're more righteous than I. You have repaid me good when I've repaid you evil. You have declared this day how you have dealt well with me. You did not kill me when the Lord put me into your hands. For if a man finds his enemy, will he let him go away safe? So may the Lord reward you with good for what you have done to me this day. And now, behold, David, I know, here it is, that you shall surely be king, that the kingdom of Israel shall be established in your hand. And this was the beginning of the end of hostility between Saul and David. 
Had David in that cave raised his hand against Saul, he may have well become king sooner, but it may well have led to civil war in Israel as well. But by choosing the better way of grace and the better way of mercy, David showed what kind of king he truly would be for God's people. And even more than that, in this story, David gives us a glimpse of the grace and mercy that God offers to each of us in Jesus Christ. Friends, each of us is many things. Each of us wears different hats. We are spouses, we are children, we are parents, we're aunties, uncles, grandparents, we're friends, we're employees, we're many, many more things. We can be defined so many different ways. But more than anything else, we need to understand that we are first and foremost children of God, anointed with God's Spirit, anointed to be co-heirs with Christ, and therefore we are objects of God's mercy and God's grace. And to say so isn't bragging because we have done absolutely nothing at all to deserve it. It is unmerited favor. The grace and mercy of God are not grounded in what we have done, but in who God is. And as those who are objects of God's grace and God's mercy, the Apostle Paul gives expression to how we are called to show this better way to those we encounter. When he said, bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with one another. Don't be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Do not be wise in your own sight. Do not repay evil for evil. Give thought to do what is honorable for all. And if possible, So far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Never avenge yourselves, but leave it to God. For it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. To the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. For by by so doing, you will heap burning coals on his head. (laughs) Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Fun fact, the Greek for burning coals is anthrax. (laughs) Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. So this week, I want to give each of us a challenge. Are you up for a challenge? I want to challenge each of us this week to take a wee piece of paper, a note card, a sticky note, something, and write on there, write your name at the top, And right below that put, I am an object of God's grace. I'm an object of God's mercy. I'm an object of God's grace. I'm an object of God's mercy. And read this paper every morning this week when you wake up. Keep it by your nightstand. Make it the first thing you read in the morning. And then before bedtime of each day this week, I'd like to challenge each of us to read Romans 12, 14 through 21. Romans 12, 14 through 21. Read it slowly. Let the words sink in. Turn off your tablets and your smartphones and make this the last thing you read before bed. Unless your Bible's on your smartphone, then hey, do that. Romans 12, 14 through 21. Bless those who persecute you. Bless, do not curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Never be wise in your own sight. Repay no one evil for evil, but give thought to do what is honorable in the sight of all. And if possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Never avenge yourselves, but leave it to God, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay. To the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If thirsty, give him something to drink. For by so doing, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil but overcome evil with good. Do you know what happens when you treat an enemy this way? They stop being an enemy. 
is an amazing thing that happens. You know, we live in a world screaming about rights, about vengeance, about getting our fair share, about getting back at people. But we as Christians are called to a better way, a better way of grace and a better way of mercy. May the Lord help us to walk in these ways now and always. Amen. When we follow in the way of Christ, in the way of grace, and the way of mercy, that is when we will experience peace like a river, when we can say, truly, it is well with my soul.
Just a few intimations to share with our church family now. Just a gentle reminder, in the, as in the print, about our Kirk News survey. This has been circulated for a while, uh, and we're still asking folks to spare a few minutes to complete the Kirk News survey by the 1st of December, in just a few days from now, by either using the paper copy or going online to our website and filling it out. It just takes a couple minutes, so if you haven't done so already, please do fill out the Kirk News survey. A brief update on one of our uh, advertised activities, the Tier Fund Big Quiz. Unfortunately, due to logistics and numbers, uh, we've had to cancel this event for the 30th of November. So the Tier Fund Big Quiz has been canceled this year. I've been asked to express a word of thanks to all who have supported the praised evenings over the year of 2019. And Jim, before the service, told me that at the last praise service, we had the recordings of our friend Les Brown talking about the ways that God's grace and mercy touched his life in extraordinary ways. And the recordings that Les made are now available online from our webpage. And Jim, if you click on sermons, you can go from there to find the recordings of what Les said. Go, 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 to, the last go to the last recording for the last praise evening, and you'll find them listed there. So well worth listening to. Thank you, Jim, for that. Uh, and a brief update as well that um, David Hendricks, our parish assistant, is away on Tuesday to America to join his family for American Thanksgiving and to be present for a friend's wedding. And he's currently fighting a bit of a bug, so he's not here today. So please do hold David in prayer as he journeys home on Tuesday morning back to the United States for smooth travels and for his illness to let up so he can travel in more comfort. We certainly do wish him well. And also, on Tuesday the 26th of November, we'll have a meeting for Christian Aid at 1.30 p.m. in the Donaldson Room. And we're looking for new people to, who'd be willing to join the team for Christian Aid. So if you'd like to come along and even just learn more about what Christian Aid does, what it's all about, this Tuesday at the Church Center of the Donaldson Room, 1.30 p.m., we'll have a meeting, and you're most welcome to come along if you'd like to take part in that. Are there any other intimations to share with our church family? Yes, Anne. The rules I have this, this week is quarter past one. Thank you. Two. Yes. For this one. Thank you. This Wednesday, you have our monthly service at the Grove, as Anne has said, and usually that takes place at 2 p.m., but this week, because of scheduling, it'll take place at 1.15. So if you'd like to come along to support that service at the Grove, it's always appreciated. It'll be at 1.15 instead of 2 o'clock. Any other intimations? With those share then, I would invite Noel forward to lead us in prayer. Noel. Let us pray. Lord, as we come before you this morning, we pray that it is well with our soul. We rejoice in being able to worship you today in church, in Littlewood Court, in the church centre, at home or wherever else we are as we all join together. We consider today the better way of love, of following your way, of considering each other, and we pray for these as we bring our world concerns to you. Father, where there are uprisings, discontent with governments for many reasons, we pray for your grace, your mercy and love to shine through, your enabling of consideration for other, of others, for peaceful talks and resolution. Father, where there are wars and fighting, we pray for ways forward through talking, through listening, through laying down of weapons, for trust to begin to be formed again, and for peace. I ask you to remember countries that you are particularly praying for at this time.
where there are floods, where there is famine, we pray for your intervention through the sharing by others. Support and help from those who have to those who have lost everything. Particularly we think of those who are still recovering from conflict as well as flooding. May your love shine through this giving, sharing and receiving. It is often alongside those who have little, but will share this little with those who have nothing, that we see your love and grace at work. Thank you, Lord, for them and bless them as only you can. Where there is hate, deceit, disorder and anger, Lord, we pray for your peace. We pray that you can help us to respect and honour and tolerate each other. And we think about this particularly as we look, as we look at our own elections in the UK. But there are other elections in other countries and we pray this for them too. Help us to hate what is evil, to cling to what is good, to honour others, to agree to disagree, thus trying to live in harmony as far as we are able. Where there is grief and mourning, sickness in its many forms, Lord, help us to be there and walk with people. Remembering particularly the family of Hilda Begg at this time. Help us at all times to be joyful in hope, patient in times of illness and weariness, and willing to walk the extra mile with those who need us. We have received your grace and mercy, Lord, in uncountable amounts. Help us to share it that others may know your mercy, your grace. And in all these things, Lord, strengthen us to do your will as best we can. We ask these things in the name of Jesus Christ, who lived, died, and rose again, that we might have life. Amen. Thank you, Noel. Walking and living in the way of grace and mercy, we cannot do it by ourselves. We're not meant to do it by ourselves. It is a way of life, a way of being for which we always need God's help. We need God's light to show us the way. And so we sing in that spirit of faith our closing hymn, Christ is our light.
Grace is when God gives us what we don't deserve. Mercy is when God doesn't give us what we do deserve. May the grace and mercy of God be the true bedrock of each of our lives in Christ Jesus. Go forth from this place today and pay forward this grace and mercy you've been shown to all who cross your paths. And may the blessing of Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, may this blessing rest upon each of us and upon all who we love this day and forevermore. Thank you.